Welcome to Behind the Last Chair. I'm your host, Alexis Weisenberger, founder and owner of AW Lashes. My goal is to help you as a lash artist grow with tips and tricks on lashing, becoming an entrepreneur, marketing, and so much more. This is an amazing place to find free resources and connect with lash artists all around the world. Let's get started. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us. My name is Christine Tanner, and I'm a co-owner of AW Lashes. And today I'm so excited. We have Christine Rio with us. She is one of our mega volume educators who we just love. If you take a volume course or mega volume um, or classic course in the Denver area, she will more than likely be your instructor and she is fantastic. So if you do need education, you should absolutely take it look at her classes. Um, she also just recently opened her own salon, um, Rio Beauty in Centennial, Colorado. And so we're so excited to learn from her and to hear about her story and give you all the tips and tricks for all of you in your careers. Welcome, Christine. Hi, how are you? Good. Okay. So let's just jump right into this. Why don't you give us a little bit of background? What kind of education background you have, when you got started, how you got into lashes, you know, all the things. So educational wise, um, I graduated from Colorado State University. Criminal justice was my um, degree. And I worked in the criminal justice field for a while. So that's a little bit, we got to pause <laughs> right there because- <laughs> You know, you're a lash artist and, and, and that's a big jump from criminal justice to lashes. So I'm super excited to hear about how this story progresses. So keep going. <laughs> so I did that for a couple of years. Um, I worked on Canyon City. I did arm transport and then I left to become a mom and I took a break from criminal justice, stayed home for a little bit. And I kind of had quite a few different jobs worked part-time, worked at UPS. Then I got um, into the beauty industry. Um, I've always loved the beauty industry and took a break from there as I had more children. So I just, I've had a series of jobs and I was kind of caught in a spiral of jobs that weren't feeding my passion. And uh, so a friend of mine had recommended that I try lashing. Uh, talked to her about going back into retail um, when I had worked in the beauty industry. I'd worked for Bobby Brown and Matt Cosmetics. And so um, I was kind of stuck in a rut and I was telling her, I was kind of just unhappy. And I thought about going back into retail and she is an esthetician. She's also a well-known um, makeup artist in Centennial. And so she was like, why don't you try lashing? Thought it'd be a great fit for me. So I kind of looked into it and I was interested. I still needed to work full time. So I found mm -hmm. a school uh, where I could go to school on the weekends and then work during the week. And so I just jumped ten toes in and I started aesthetic school and I haven't regretted it since. I love that. But okay. So now have you ever had any regrets that you didn't go back to like criminal justice? <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, I missed it for a little bit. And I will tell you when I was kind of caught in limbo between jobs, I even tested for the fire department. I love that type of service industry. And uh -huh. so um, fire was, um, was my passion for a little bit and that just didn't pan out. I kind of started it too late in life and, and I've always, like I said, I've always loved the beauty industry, not necessarily. I, I was a manager for, um, Matt cosmetics and I love that part of it, but I didn't really love the retail part, but I loved working mm -hmm. with people. So yeah, so it just kind of transitioned also as I had more children and you know, your focus, your priorities kind of start to change. Absolutely. So have you ever, with your um, esthetician degree, did you ever do anything related to like more skin, facials, those types of things? Or did you focus just strictly on the lashes piece and using that as background for a lash career? You know, actually when I um, started, I knew I wanted to focus on lashes. I do love skincare, but during the school process, I realized I didn't really love giving facials. I love more of the, like the skincare products. And so when I came out of school, I did try dermaplaning and lashing, but I think I was overwhelmed at first. Uh, lashing, yeah. it takes a lot of practice. And so I decided I would focus on one thing and become a master of that. Mm -hmm. And then um, once I mastered that, if I wanted to go into other things, I could, you know, start practicing and doing more like facials or waxing. Um, but I just, I really fell in love with lashing. Yeah, I love that because, you know, I think 
that sometimes a lot of people come out of school and they've just been armed with all this knowledge to be able to do like all of these different things. And, and sometimes people do find themselves overwhelmed because there's like so many things. And when you're first coming out of school, you're not an expert at any. And so I love that you kind of, you saw your passion for lashes, you jumped in on that, and then you just focused on that to perfect your skills and then decided you'd add other things on later. Now, did you actually do your education there through your school or did you do other courses? Where did you do your lash certification and master those? skills. So I went to the school and then instead of doing the clinical hours, I did an internship with a salon. So I did my internship there. um, And then once I was done with all my hours and getting licensed, I started working there. My training, my initial, because when I went to school, they didn't touch on anything with lashes. Mm -hmm. Um, I think now they do a little bit, but when I went, they didn't give any type of introduction to lashing. So I took a course um, with a lady that used to um, teach classic lashes. And Mm -hmm. then once I got on with the salon, so I practiced, you know, I practiced um, classic. And then once I got on, they actually brought in Borboletta at the time. Mm -hmm. And I was certified through them for volume. Okay. And and then um, later on, I reached out to Alexis and then she, we did a one-on-one and she certified me for mega volume. How many years have you been doing lashes? Five years. Okay. So you are amazing at lashes and your mega volume is like phenomenal. Now in those five years, I'm sure you've learned some things like whether it was from classic, whether it was from volume, what are some like big tips? Like if you could talk to someone who is just getting started, what is like something that you would tell them? In regards to lashing? Yeah. I would say um, practice. There's not enough. I mean, I thought when I started, I was ready. I maybe had done like 10 full sets. Mm -hmm. Um, I think practicing is huge. Perfecting that craft. The more you lash, the faster you become. The more precise your fans become. I think that's huge. I think a lot of us just think once we've taken the course that that's kind of like it. Um, And Mm -hmm. really it's practice. It's repetition. It's a lot of motor skills with your hands, muscle memory. And Mm -hmm. I think that's huge. So practice, definitely practice. What about continuing education and courses? Before COVID, I would do probably 10 clients a day, every hour on the hour. Mm -hmm. Um, I really didn't take a lunch, which isn't the healthiest, but I didn't really take a lunch and my hands were exhausted at the end of the day. So kind of COVID happened. I didn't practice lashing during that time. Mm -hmm. And I noticed when I came back, I was slow, really slow. Like I couldn't even get in. Like before I said, I would do 10 every hour on the hour before COVID. Mm -hmm. And after COVID, I was struggling. And that's when I reached out to AW um, and met Alexis. And, you know, I was struggling and I was like, I need, you know, I need help. Like I, I'm not sure. I know it was, probably because I hadn't lashed in a while, but Mm -hmm. also I was just kind of struggling. And so we did a one-on-one and we worked on a lot of different things, just from making fans to your confidence. She just was really able to kind of meet my needs and see where I was lacking, what I was lacking um, and perfect it for me. As you were working with Alexis and you mentioned you were doing 10 clients a day, like how many days a week were you working? So I usually worked, I would usually take Wednesday and Sunday off unless I was going out of town or something, then I would make up for it like on a Wednesday and take clients. But Mm -hmm. yeah, so I worked five days a week. Five days a week for 10 Mm -hmm. hours a day. So you Mm -hmm. were doing like a 50 hour work week lashing. Did your, I mean, you were talking about your hand fatigue. I can't even imagine with all the fine motor skills and the tweezers and the isolating and the, the fans and all of that kind of stuff. I mean, how were you holding up? You know, I, I love to work out. So I think that really helps. It strengthens the entire body. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, So I'm an advocate of physical fitness. And then also I think getting massages help on a regular stretching is huge. I think it's also important what type of, like I purchased an ergonomically friendly aesthetics chair. So which kind of helps give me a little bit of back support. I know a lot of lash artists kind of sit either like on a stool or some type of saddle. And Mm -hmm. mine is a saddle, but it also has a back to it. Okay. Um, 
And I think that's huge for me. That helps. Um, believe it or not, it helps my posture, I feel like, throughout the day. So I'm not always hunched over. So do you find, though, if you would have kept going, because you mentioned that was pre-COVID. So you were doing like a 50-hour work week. What does your schedule look like now? Now, um, I would say I probably do maybe eight clients a day. I think I just take care of my my body a little bit better as far as I do make sure I stretch a little bit more throughout the day. Um, I also did invest in a massage chair at home. <laughs> so I have a oh. massage chair at home. Yeah. And then also just making sure my day is not too crowded. I mean, I still pretty much lash every hour or every 75 minutes. I do make sure I, um, I'll usually do like a protein drink throughout the day. Um, if I don't take a lunch, uh-huh. whereas that's different kind of before I wouldn't really eat anything at all. And I kind of would hit a wall during those yeah. you know, 10 hours before COVID. So um, I think that's a big difference. Also, there's also, I use pre-made fans at times. So I still will, I'll still do handmade fans. And then also I'll do pre-made fans too. Mm-hmm. So do so you that find, has helped save my hands? I was just going to say, do you find that using the pre-mades help because you don't have, I mean, how do you create your fans? What's your method? So I am a pincher. Okay. And <laughs> that can, um, that can be pretty tiring at the end of the day. Yeah. I can't even imagine like even doing eight clients a day. And, and here's a question too, like how many days a week are you still working? Are you still doing like the five days a week or have you changed that a little bit? So I still work five days a week. And so, but you're doing about eight clients. Do you find about that you still hit that wall or are you like, it's okay now because you're mixing in the pre-mades, you have the chair, you have the massage chair at home. Have you found that those adaptations that you've done have helped you to be able to do more clients or, you know what I mean, to find that balance? Yes, it has. And like I said, the pre-mades were huge. I never had tried them before COVID. Uh-huh. Um, they kind of they kind of have a bad rap, honestly. Yeah, I mean, they totally do. <laughs> and they've evolved so much. I mean, I now they're just the base of the fans are so precise. They're so, I would say thin. I mean, they're amazing. And I feel like I ha- actually have some clients that prefer the pre-made fan Interesting. over handmade, which I hadn't experienced before. That's crazy. But I mean, Hey, that's great. <laughs> and I think some of it is the consistency of a, of a pre-made fan. Because I know a lot of times pre-mades, I think they've gotten a bad rap for a couple of reasons. One being that people who have not trained, they're kind of using it as a way to not have to create their own fans. Um, And so I think some lash artists who have done the hard work, they've done the education, they practice, they perfected their fans, they perfected their mega volume skills, all of those kinds of things. Now, you know, people who don't have to spend hundreds and thousands of dollars in training to be able to develop those skills are kind of moving in and just being able to use these pre-mades. But I don't feel like that's necessarily the case because I feel like, and please jump in because obviously you're the mega volume instructor here. I feel like the mega volume course, because it goes so much into mapping and taping and layering. Yes. It, if you don't have that basis of education, if you don't have that foundation and understanding the balance of fans and how to wrap them on the lash and how to place them based on, you know, what's going on with the natural lash and all of those kinds of things. And then all of the skills you develop in the other education, you're not going to be able to get the same kind of retention and look and all of those kinds of things as an artist who has had all that education and training and then chooses to use the pre-mades can achieve. You're absolutely correct. And being an instructor, you know, that's why I still will do handmade fans because obviously I have to teach a course and I have to, I have students that have to learn from me. So I have to be Mm -hmm. able to still have those skills. So I think it's important that you, you know, continue and not, I just don't rely solely on the pre-made fans, but I do think they can help. And like you said, there is more that goes into using pre-made fans, like you said, the mapping, the taping, being able to wrap the fans and you have to be trained. Absolutely. So as you've been working with students and educating them in the mega volume and volume and even classic, what would you say is probably one of the biggest hurdles that you've seen that some students have? I think um, isolation is huge. Yeah. 
I think people have a hard time just with the, cause you use your fine motor skills, you know, you're using your left hand, which, you know, if you're, you know, right-handed can be hard, but mm-hmm. you actually, you know, you have to use both of your hands. And so I think isolating can be hard, especially depending on what type of, everybody's got, you know, different eye shape, different lash growth. Some lashes are harder to lash than others. And so I think isolating is a huge one when people are starting out, being able to isolate that lash and then hold it and then use the right hand, you know, to place that fan. Absolutely. And also because it's so key too, because if you accidentally glue a couple of lashes together, it's going to cause pain. It can cause lash damage. Loss. Exactly. Yeah. All of those kinds of things that I think previously, because, you know, once upon a time, we're so heavily embedded into, you know, this industry and it's been around now for quite some time, but initially, you know, lashes themselves had a bad rap. And I think a lot of it was due to isolation and not having the knowledge and the education to really apply the lashes correctly. You know, back before there was many restrictions and people were just kind of doing them from wherever and mm-hmm. not having all the education behind. So I, I just, I mean, I know we've talked about this several times on this call, but I feel like education is so big in the industry and it will help you build your clientele. I mean, I know sometimes it's daunting to like spend more money when you feel like you're just getting your feet on the ground, but having that education and that experience, I just, I feel like is so crucial because then you'll have happy clients who then the word of mouth will spread and help you to build your clientele. We mentioned that you just opened a new salon. How did you start to build your clientele now that we've kind of broached on the whole clientele topic? So building my clientele, I basically kind of started out with just friends and family, people that are interested in getting lashes. And so I, when I initially started after my training, I said, okay, I'm going to pick, I maybe had like two to three friends that I said, I'm going to lash them on a regular. My friends that I pretty much started just lashing for free. And they were ones that I could try different maps on, different adhesives, just different looks. And if you messed up a little bit, they would still love you. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> so I started there <laughs> and, um, and then eventually, you know, friends of friends wanted to get their lashes done. And so, um, that's just really kind of how I built was within like my community. So friends of friends, um, people from the gym, um, I, you know, my gym community and just, like I said, the news would kind of spread. And before I knew it, I mean, I think I built my clientele probably within, I would say six months. And so, and it was primarily word of mouth. Did you, I know. Word of mouth. Yeah, because I know sometimes lash artists are tempted into boosting all these posts and trying to do social media ads and things like that. And, and I feel like a lot of times that if you are using and utilizing social media, the free aspect as much as you can, and also just having a really good relationship with your clients and that you'll build your clientele. It may take a minute, but you will Uh be your clientele. You will. And I do think social media helps. It's kind of interesting how some people will go to social media to see where to get their hair done, where to get their lashes done, their nails. Uh Uh, And then also I think, so I think that's very important because I think a lot of people go to Instagram for that. But then also, like I said, word of mouth, friends of friends, you know, people Mm -hmm. that people that can can actually see your work on somebody else and say, oh my gosh, I love that. And then they're like, where do you go? So I think that it's huge too. I think they work together. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think you need to have that presence and you need to utilize all of those free tools. I just don't think, I think sometimes people think, oh, if I boost these posts and if I do X, Y, and Z and spend all this money, it'll just automatically build my clientele. But I think that word of mouth, that is so key because you cannot beat that. It's unsolicited advertising. It truly is. If somebody sees your work on someone else and um, they think it's good, then they're going to come to you because of your skill. So absolutely. I'll admit like when I, Alexis did my lashes for the first time when I got them done and then she found me an artist. (laughs) So there you go. (laughs) Anyway. And now I, I've had so many people they'll, you know, stop me and say, Oh, your eyelashes look so great. And it does. It helps build the clientele 
for your lash artist. And so also instead of um, spending a lot on social media advertising, which may be a little trickier to really pinpoint and target your audience, especially because unless they are specifically looking for a lash artist, you're hitting Mm -hmm. them. Um, social media, if you think of it as like a marketing funnel, social media is like much higher up. They have to see your ads and those kinds of things a lot more frequently to be able to then act on it versus if someone sees your work on someone else, it's much more convincing, much more compelling. Absolutely. Word of mouth. How else did you build your clientele? Other than just word of mouth, did you advertise? Did you do any like promotions? Did you do, you know, referral programs or anything like that? So I did do a promotion, I would say probably for like that first month, you know, Uh kind of being introduced um, to the industry. So I did a special for full sets. Um, I want to say I started maybe in November, which was a good time because it's holiday. So I did do a special for like that full month for, um, for full sets, which, um, you know, is a great thing to do because full sets, as we know, can be pretty pricey. And so when you kind of do them half price, which I think is just a great idea because when you're starting out, you're not as fast or, um, as the other artist. And so I think that's a great way to kind of give yourself like a month or two of transitioning, um, and kind of perfecting your, your craft. So I did do, um, specials for like the first I want to say probably November um, and December. And Mm -hmm. then I posted coming January that I would be raising my prices. So there's, there's one thing to touch on raising prices. So in the last five years that you've been doing lashes, what were your starting prices? I mean, like how different, how many times have you raised prices, you know, and how did you do that? And how did you make that decision? And how did your clients take it? I mean, I know that was like a million questions just right there. In the <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I feel like mm-hmm. so many artists struggle with that. When do I raise prices? How much do I raise prices? Am I going to lose all my clients? You know, you do. It is hard. It is hard to make that. I think when you start, it's a little bit easier because you're new. Um, and so your prices are, are of course lower than the other artists that have been there. So then when you raise it initially that first time, it's not as, you don't feel as bad because it's, you know, you've been somewhere for a couple months. And so you're like, okay, now I'm going to transition and kind of bump them up a little bit. I would say I probably have only raised my prices, I think twice, and I haven't raised them within the last two years and I'll probably raise them come January. When you've raised your prices previously, did you lose a lot of clients? No. So most of them, no. now, did you do like significant or did you do like five, $10 increments? I would say five to $10 increments. Okay. So it wasn't um, a huge hit to their pocketbook when you were raising it. It wasn't. It wasn't. And when you look at things, I mean, like inflation, I mean, everything is kind of oh. prices of groceries, gas. I mean, everything has gone up. And um, it is your livelihood. It is your job. I think people respect it. They understand. And like I said, you know, when it's like five or $10, I don't think it's as big of a hit. And so that's why I feel like it's been probably two years since I've raised them. I initially, when I came over to AW, I didn't raise them just because all my clients just transitioned with me and kind of as a thank you for, you know, continuing with me, I didn't raise them. And then come January, I will raise them. So it will have been a year. I feel like sometimes when you do raise your prices, you are going to lose some clients. You know, there are going to be some Mm -hmm. like, you know what, I can find this cheaper somewhere else. And that's okay. Because if you're raising your prices, you're going to compensate, you know, you're not going to feel that financially and new clients will come. And so make sure, you know, I hope that people are making sure that they're actually getting paid what they're worth. You know, if you have the skills, you have the training, you have the experience, make sure that your prices reflect that. That's so very important because I think as a beginning artist, we tend to, um, I know at some point I found myself saying, well, maybe I'll give this person a deal. Well, maybe I'll, you know, so you start kind of dumbing down your prices and, and it's not good, you know, because then you've got kind of, you know, you've got different people paying different things. And to me, you've got to keep it consistent. And if they want to come to you, they're going to come to you. And if you're not the lash artist for them, that's okay. You know, they'll find somebody else 
and then you'll find that that other client that wants to come to you. So I just think it you have to be consistent and, and be confident in your skills. Absolutely. And make sure that you're valued. And I mean, because we don't go anywhere else. You don't go to a grocery store and say, oh, we're friends. So right. give me a deal. <laughs> you know, it's not like we do that. That is and so I don't know why our industry does that, but so often that is the case. This is your livelihood and this is your job. Right. And if you're discounting it for everybody, then how are you going to continue to mm -hmm. make your rent and pay for your electric bill and your Wi-Fi and your supplies and all of those things that go into being an entrepreneur, so to speak, or if yeah. you're working on commission, you're just receiving less so um, I think that is so crucial, actually being paid what you're worth and making sure that your prices reflect your hard work as an artist. So here's a question just because, you know, I want to know, <laughs> right? <laughs> but when you were starting out, did you have, I would love to hear, you know, a horror story because sometimes I feel like, you know, we look at like people like you, lash artists like you, and your work is phenomenal. And we see all the perfection in it. And we forget that five years ago, you were just starting out and you were struggling just like so many other new artists. So I just have to hear what is like one of those horror moments that you're just like, oh my heavens. I mean, there's quite a few, right? But I want to say probably I had a mother and daughter and I did two full sets when we were done. I gave them the total and they were like, oh my gosh, I didn't think it was going to be this much. Like, I think they thought it was going to be a hundred dollars total. She was just so uncomfortable with the price. I think a lot of people don't know how it works. Like we assume when they book a full set, mm -hmm. they should know it's going to take two and a half to three hours, depending on the artist. They should score. This is a luxury service. Right. <laughs> so I was just, it was kind of embarrassing because I kind of worked in an open environment and I did the mother full set. I did the daughter full set. And she was like, oh my goodness. Like I had no idea that it was going to be this much. Like thinking to myself, does that mean like you're not going to pay me? <laughs> right after you've just spent like four to five hours doing their full sets on the two of them. Yes. And so that was just, I was, you know, and then for a minute I was like thinking, well, okay, so maybe not 500, like shoot, you want to do 300? For a minute, I thought about saying that. And then I was like, well, no, because if money was, you know, if you're on a budget, we usually tend to ask those things. Like how much is this going to be? How much are fills? How much are full set? Because I, I know if I'm on a budget and I'm going to get my nails done or my toes done, something that's not a necessity, I'm going to ask. Absolutely. And so for, for a minute, I did think about saying, okay, well, how much can you afford? But then I was like, well, no, like, no, like I, that was my time. That was my, um, you know, that's my artistry. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I was just a little bit like, I felt kind of embarrassed because, you know, like everybody's kind of like looking at me. There's other clients there. There's other lash artists, estheticians. So I was like a little bit in panic mode for a minute. But I mean, she was like, fine. She was like, okay, um, you know, she made arrangements. She paid for it. But I just was like, oh my goodness. And well, but people don't know. That's why when, you know, when I book a full set and if it's somebody new now that I don't recognize, I call them before the appointment. I call to educate them, let them know it's going to take two to two and a half hours, you know, and I just kind of talk to them. And it's not necessarily just to throw out my prices, but just to kind of see what they're looking for. And they know what they're getting, you know, because a lot of people think full set is like a fill. And they're totally different. Um, yeah. So, you know, I do like to explain it. I want to make sure that, um, you know, what they're looking for is what I can give them. Let them know time frame because sometimes you have people that come in, they don't realize that it's going to take two and a half hours. And they're like, oh my gosh, I'm on lunch. I only have an hour and it's a full set. You're like, good luck. So, <laughs> <laughs> so now I kind of call, you know, before just to kind of give them an idea. Um, and then also let them know, okay, well, you know, mega volume is this much. Um, it's going to take this amount of time. I just want to let you know. And then also let them know if you want to bring, you know, like your AirPods and you can listen to um, a podcast or something like that. But mm -hmm. just to kind of educate them, because there's a lot of people doing different things in this industry and um, they're not always the correct way. 
you know? Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> you just like to, you just, I, I just like to educate them and prepare them before they come. So then my schedule's not thrown off. Their schedule isn't thrown off. You know, we respect each other's time. And there isn't a surprise at the end. That's correct. That's, and that's huge. Cause if you have somebody that's going to certain places, some full sets are like a hundred dollars. It could be like a volume and they're like 150. And then you go to um, like a master lash artist and their full set might be 300. Exactly. So I think it is, I think it is good to kind of get a feel for your client, to kind of educate them, let them know what to expect and not just financially, but time-wise too. Well, and I love that you call them and talk to them. And it probably also gives you a good vibe of the customer too, because you kind of touched on this before, but I feel like there is a lash artist for everybody. And one person, one client might not be the ideal client for a particular lash artist because lash artists all have kind of their own vibe and style. And so making sure that the style that you do, the way you like to lash, those types of things are within that lifestyle and what they're looking for. Because, you know, there are some clients that want super long lengths and there are some lash artists that don't feel comfortable doing like super long lengths. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Or some, you know, lash artists are really, really good at creating really dense lash lines and others aren't. And so finding someone that can meet your needs as a client and also as a lash artist, you know, making sure that that client is going to be happy with your work is also very important. And then I also like to tell them if they've got a picture of lashes that yeah that have kind of inspired them and they they kind of want to achieve that look I can I usually tell them to text it to me or bring it to the appointment yep. and that way we're on the same page because somebody will tell me natural or I want volume and their volume and my volume is totally different so <laughs> I think it's, <laughs> so I think it's really important because you know it's it's all in the eye of the beholder so I'm like just you know send me a picture I'll bring in a picture of kind of what you're thinking Mm -hmm. Um, and so we're on the same page. Well, and I, and I love that you talk to them too, because I think sometimes people don't realize that you're going to have to come every two to three weeks. If you want to upkeep your lashes, mm -hmm. it's definitely a time commitment. It's something that saves you time on a daily basis, but that you have to do maintenance every two to three weeks to be able to have that convenience every day. And that you need to be washing your lashes because, you know, oh, yeah, you know, and <laughs> keeping them clean and brushing them because your natural lashes naturally, you know, clean themselves, <laughs> you know, with your eyes and things like that. But when you put lash extensions on them, they can't naturally do that anymore. And so if people aren't taking care of them, it can be a whole host of like health problems and things like that as well. So I love that you take a moment to educate your clients on price, what to expect, and to have that conversation to make sure that this is really and truly what they're looking for as well. It is important and it'll save a lot of time. Um, and so they're not disappointed. I think a lot of people think lashes when they get them, like they can come once a month and that's, that's not true. No, not at all. I am one of those people. I have to get my lashes done every two weeks because my lashes grow so fast that they'll start mm -hmm. turning and twisting and they just get so grown out. And so it, absolutely. And it differs from person to person too. If you're a person with fast growing lashes, then you have to go more frequently. So listening and being able to educate people and help them to be happy, because I think if you take that time to educate people too, like we were talking about earlier, that will also help you build your clientele. So anyway, in wrapping up, we'll wrap up here, but is there any last advice that you could give new lash artists that you can think of? I would say we talked about just the um, education piece and being a lash artist, you know, being an esthetician, there's so, there's so many things that fall under that umbrella. And so um, like for me, I just chose to kind of focus on lashes at first. And then it just took off to where I um, built my clientele. And um, I've been so successful and busy with just lashing. I haven't really dabbled or felt the need to do any other type of services. But I feel like sometimes you can kind of get stuck in a rut. And I think the additional education is huge. Um, I think it just kind of adds a little fire. It kind of helps motivate you um, because, you know, just day in and day out, lashing all day 
can kind of get, I think, redundant after a while, it's very yeah. tedious. And I think that's kind of how I felt towards like right before COVID. And then, like I said, when I reached out to Alexis, that was just a whole game changer. Just her energy, her knowledge, very intelligent. She just knew the ins and outs of the industry. And there's so much more to just lashing. There's always things you can do to perfect your craft. I mean, I've been lashing for, what, four and a half years. And I never had really knew the ins and outs of taping. I just knew like the mm-hmm. basic, basic taping methods. And um, doing that one-on-one with her, she taught me so many different tips and tricks. So I just think there's always so much to learn. I think it helps motivate you. I kind of was, I don't want to say burnt out, but not really feeling inspired. And then once I became part of the AW family, it's just huge. I mean, she offers so many different programs from being an influencer, which is amazing. I mean, I had never worked with um, a company that offered that you know, and it's being able to work with different artists, being on a panel of trying different products. I mean, I think that's huge. It's this, like I said, there's just more to just lashing every day. There's so much more behind the scenes of it too. I love that. Well, thank you so much, Christine, for being with us today and for sharing your knowledge and experience with everyone. We so appreciate you and all that you do for AW and for the industry. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad I found um, AW. It's been a blessing. Thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us today. And um, please keep your eyes open for our next episode.